You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. All right, perfect. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Ahrens. I'm Jared Mounts with Jake's Bait and Tackle. So we got a tag team today, don't we? Yeah, so uh, you guys have, have seen uh, John Odenkirk before with the state on, on a previous mm-hmm. podcast, and uh, Jeff Kelby as well. And Jeff, uh, for our viewers and listeners, uh, you've, you've had quite an extensive uh, background in, in fisheries on the river, um, starting off as a guide. Um, and then I think when I first met you, you were a Shenandoah Riverkeeper, which at that time I had no clue that what a Riverkeeper was or what they did. Uh, and Welcome then you went the on club. to the Potomac Riverkeeper <laughs> and actually did a lot of work in D.C., Washington, D.C., legislation and different things. And, um, and then now you're kind of coming full circle with, with Ashby Gap uh, Adventures and your local guy. And so uh, one thing we wanted to try to do in this segment is you know i think a lot of times we we all enjoy fishing we've all grown up fishing and enjoy the fishery we don't often think about uh that fishery as a resource and it's a live resource and the ecosystem as a whole and i think we have a responsibility uh, as anglers uh to make sure that that resource is uh, healthy for not just our generation but also future generations so we'll kind of get into that today before we do uh, Jeff, kind of just tell us a little bit about yourself and, and that experience that, that I mentioned. Well, thanks for having me, guys. I'm 50 years old. I started in the industry in 1999. Uh, started rowing boats in Harpers Ferry, uh, working a little bit for Mark Kovach Fishing Services. The guys up there that were part of the Potomac River Smallmouth Club asked me to come out and guide. I was the president of the Potomac River Smallmouth Club at the time. So I was 99, I think 2000. Um, it was after I did all the other, you know, membership newsletter and all the other things there and then finally they gave me the presidency which was um, a lot of work great club i mean at the time the club was thriving the fisheries were crushing you know we'd gotten out of the 96 floods we had massive reproduction in 97 those fish grew to 12 inches in their first year um and we had an amazing fishery we ended up having a really big fish fishery that i moved my guide service into so i had really good timing <laughs> made me look like, like i was a really good guide so i got it probably in the superstar years of the river um got fairly good at finding big fish which is, as you guys have covered before mm-hmm. in the game department talks about the memorable fish concept and for sure my my theory as a guide was um if a guy either catches or loses a fish i wasn't sure which was better for the business but if they mm-hmm. saw a giant fish right. made a huge impression on them mm-hmm. they would want to come back oh, um yeah. so i spent a lot of my time um uh, <clears throat> really sp- i spent time with chuck raft who's probably the best fishing guide this planet has ever seen who passed away um, a couple years ago and um gave uh you know gave it a, a pretty good pretty good shot and then we lost a fishery. Um, first, we lost the North Fork in 2004 to a series of fish kills that lasted about two months. And um, virtually nobody observed it. Mm-hmm. It was April and May. People, you generally start to fish that river in May, mm-hmm. late May, June, when they can wait it. Um, and there were rumors, and I was guiding it, and I saw some mortality. Um, and um, th- th- and I'm getting into this because this is kind of how I got into conservation. Mm-hmm. I, was, sure. I, was, I was taken there. Mm-hmm. I didn't set out to, gotcha. be, to get into, mm-hmm. into conservation. Okay. Um, I set out to be a fishing guide. Mm-hmm. And uh, I kept going to the North Fork even while the fish were dying. And I told my clients I wanted to take them, but I didn't want them to pay me. I just needed to see what was happening. Mm. Um, Game department was loosely aware of it as well. It wasn't until 2005 when the South Fork got pulled in. Um, Chuck Kraft, who I've mentioned, called me uh, around April 9th. He said, Kelby, are you out there? I said, I've just got back from the New River. I haven't been out. He said, we have dead fish in every eddy, you know, all mm-hmm. over the place on the upper South Fork. And he said, watch the lower South Fork. And I was running trips, basically Lou Ray down to- What year was this again? 2005. 2005. And specifically on the North, what's, what section of that? On What the- area? North Fork? originally I, I ran the strasburg area. strasburg well okay. i had i had three floats gotcha. so uh, you know and you're when if you want to make a living as a fishing guide which is not an easy thing to do right. you need to have a lot of stretches of the river because rivers are going up and down all the time right so you'd have to kind of cherry pick so i had a stretch in the way upper north fork in the center of the north fork in the lower gotcha. north fork okay. upper south fork two in the lower mm-hmm. south fork main stem and potomac mm-hmm. and so with that 
combination. I even made it through the 03 year, which mm -hmm. before 2018 was the wettest year we'd seen on record. I made it through and only canceled one trip in oh, the wow. season. So my season was between 150 and 175 trips a year, which is about all you can do mm -hmm. March to no through November. Mm -hmm. And then December, January, December, January is sporadic. Mm -hmm. You can get trips. Um, but if you're a rafting guide, which I was, I was in a jet boat guide, it's not the primary season. Mm -hmm. So, um, I, I literally watched the fish kill on the North Fork, I mean, sorry, on the South Fork in 2005 develop. Mm. And um, in that year, we our fish went on beds on April 14th. I know you guys have covered the spawn. It was early. We had uh, 60 degrees. We had a fairly significant warming trend. That is the earliest I've seen them on beds with eggs. I've seen them sweep beds as early as mid-March. When, mm. when the water hits, if they've moved, when the water hits 60 degrees, on an upward trend, mm -hmm. males will sweep, but there's no females with gravid eggs. They're not ready to lay, and so April 14th is about as early as we'll get at this at this latitude. We won't see it any earlier than that. Mm -hmm. um, and they were on beds. Um, they had eggs. They're fertilized eggs. They were tending, and then about third fourth day in, they started turning black. They literally looked like they were jet black, like charcoal mm -hmm. color of their young, and um, they were stopped having. A, like a flight or fright. So I, you know, look at this bass and it was kind of sulking around in its spawning area, not really tending its eggs, you know, carefully. I'd move my boat in to look and they wouldn't swim off and they were just sort of lost their, their fear. And so that was the beginning of it. And it sort of, it developed and um, not every fish uh, and not all, this, all of a sudden. It took about six weeks. We lost what I estimated was somewhere between five and 10% of the fish each week. And by the end of it, in the it depended on where you were. In the upper South Fork, we had about ninety five percent mortality of the smallmouth. Wow. We had about a hundred percent mortality of rock bass. Yeah. Somewhere around ninety percent of mortality of the sunfish. And when we get down into the main stem, it was closer between fifty and seventy percent, depending on where you were. Um, Potomac had some impact, but it wasn't as significant. Mm. And I think the game department estimated like the average about an eighty percent fish kill. <clears throat> and you know, most fish kills are related to a spill or an anoxic environment, crash of algae, right? Algae blooms, algae dies, so the decay of the algae pulls all the oxygen out of the water. Occasionally you have, um, you have mortality associated with like a really heavy turnover in the fall. Uh, it's none of that. So for, that, for those that don't know too, so like, and this is why this is good too, because we don't like anglers, we're floating, like yeah. we're kind of seeing it too, or you're not catching, you're not getting the same catch rates. And it's yeah. kind of like what has happened. And so what, What's happening behind the scenes that we don't know about? Like, so when you get this phone call and then even with the state, like, is there a collaboration that's happening, you know, amongst yeah. these mines to, to get on the water and start doing testing? And you know, how does that work? It, it ended up being what I mentioned to John earlier was probably the largest collaboration um, hmm. the area has ever seen, maybe has ever occurred in the United States. Really? We had, and, and Steve Reeser um, was asked to form the Fish Kill Task Force, Steve was out of the of her own office. Currently, um, my boss. Currently, your boss. Yeah. Oh, well, Steve's one of my favorite people. He's a good dude. Yeah, and uh, not an easy job. You know, you assemble you assemble the industry because industry needed to be represented, and that meant um, large manufacturing facilities, the the agricultural interests, um, housing, um, citizens groups. Uh, I was because I was documenting it. I and mean, I literally took out a pen and paper and I documented what I saw for about a month um, because there was nobody else out there. And I thought this is going to happen and it's, mm. no one's going to know what happened. I guess I got to write it down. My memory is not good enough. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I've been hitting that too many times. So I wrote down, took really copious notes what I saw, catch rates, observations of fish mortality. Um, and then I was able to bring those observations. So I think the contributions that I made were that I knew the fishery, I knew the fish, I knew the ecology of the fish. I'd been watching them mm -hmm. since for at that time for a decade, really closely. Mm -hmm. um, felt like I understood them pretty intimately from wintering to into pre-spawn reproduction to summer, how they move into wintering water again, their movements up and down the river, fish population dynamics, things like that. Um, I paid very close attention to it because I had oars in my hands every day for 10 hours. I just got to look, <laughs> I wasn't fishing. Fishing right. a lot of times makes you not see stuff, but um, anyway, uh, the fish kill task force assembled and it ended up, it looked like no other fish kill that anybody could remember or knew of. And that attracted some amazing scientists. So scientists are curious people. They like to solve problems. 
they like unique um, challenges. And so we had some of the top fishery scientists, eco ecological scientists in, in the United States, which probably means the world, were attracted to the task force. Um, and it was, so I continued to guide in 05, but I had to change. I, I moved, <laughs> believe it or not, um, I wanted to keep my, my clients together. I had five days booked for the whole season. And generally I was done booking usually by about March. And so I had to go somewhere. I wanted to take my fishermen somewhere. So a lot of them, the fly fishermen, all learned how to catch carp on fly. Mm -hmm. we, we learned it together. And then the guys that didn't want to do that, I took them to the Rappahan, basically. And that hmm. fishery, I, I got some private landowners to agree to let me use some of the stretches. So I used the stretches between Remington and the confluence. And I was able to make a living uh, mm -hmm. doing that. And, um, but back to the task force, um, it was it was assembled early, I guess, early in 05. And then I was approached in the fall of 05. I had a daughter on the, on the way. I had just opened a bed and breakfast in the Shenandoah that I built for, made for two years. You know, we moved out here to, to you know, to establish a guide service and uh, build a B&B. &B. And, um, and then the fishery collapsed. My wife and I talked about whether we need to move, you know, go to the James, go to the Susquehanna, mm -hmm. or change our plans altogether. And that's when um, Ed Merrifield, who was the Potomac River Keeper at the time, called me. I'd been working with him on some things related to Potomac River Keeper. Mm -hmm. um, I was watching, I was with his river watcher on a number of stretches of the river for about five years. Hmm. And um, he said, I have four foundations that want to put money into a pool to hire a person full time to work on the issues in the Shenandoah. Are you in the position to do that? Hmm. And then eventually I agreed to it. And so I, came to it by invitation and didn't set out to be a conservationist. I mm -hmm. knew nothing about it. <laughs> I was pretty excited to be on the task force because I just wanted to get in there and figure it out. I wanted to be with the scientists and mm -hmm. the game department. And I wanted, you know, we all had a wild ideas about what was causing mm -hmm. the fish kills. And, you know, everybody said this or that, which we don't have to get into today. Mm -hmm. um, Did you have any like biology experience, any like schooling or anything? I mean, you very I, knowledgeable about it. Was that something that was learned? I mean, or? I was a pre-med student, so okay. I took gotcha. organic chemistry and physical chemistry and gotcha. biology, various levels things. But I had no f a formal training in, in right. this other than just looking in the river for mm -hmm. hours a day, daydreaming. It's worth a lot. Yeah, I think it is. <laughs> yeah, it's, and my, my, there's probably nobody that knows how fish spawn better than I do. It's my mom right. that spawn better than I do right now. And, and I think the Tro boy, Tro brothers down in Mossy Creek mm -hmm. know what they're doing. For sure, um, mm -hmm. Chuck taught me a lot, and I took it from there. But I, you know, back in '05 when we were working with the U.S. Geological Survey, I mean, I would I took Vicky Blazer down the river, and we identified identified every nest in the, the most prolific stretch of reproductory water in the South Fork and Shenandoah, and we G, we took one of the super high end GPS systems. She wanted to see if there was a relation to geology, where certain fish died, certain fish didn't, deposit depositions of toxic sediments. We looked at everything. Wow. Uh, we looked at, we took, we vacuumed eggs off of nests. We looked at the chemical compounds that were in the embryos yolk sac to see what they were consuming when they were going through sexual reproduction and de sexual development. And we, and Vicky learned that almost 100% of our fish were intersex. All, almost all the males were producing eggs or immature eggs in their really? testicles. Um, that was discovered originally on the South Branch Potomac. And then it was, and that was, they had a, a light case. <laughs> the Shenandoah had the big case. So Shenandoah, oops, sorry about that. Shenandoah had, uh, had uh, almost 100% intersex in its males. Now they weren't laying eggs and the eggs didn't mature, but they were producing them. Is that too shallow of a gene pool or is it actually like a chemical imbalance that through generations created that type of um, out? Like she believes it's exposure to um, estrogen mimics while they're going through sexual differentiation. While So when, you know, fries, but when an egg emerges, this is tiny little you know, it looks like a sesame seed, but it's black, charcoal black, and mm -hmm. has an egg sac. And for about, depends on water temp, two to four days, it's just consuming its yolk sac. And that's when, that is actually the period when it differentiates into a male or a female, hmm. is while it's consuming that yolk sac. And so one of the theories to feminization of the males was that it was exposure to estrogen mimics while they were hmm. sexually differentiating. And um, so anyway, I mean, we're getting into some real detail, but this is the kind of depth that this, this task force went into to look at every potential theory. And when we sat down, the first meeting that Steve conducted, everybody in the room, you know, shared potential theories. 
and we looked at them and there were 13. And so we broke the task force out into 13 groups and everybody went home to try to research some, something that would, that would be a preliminary study that might support the theory. And 13 people came back with evidence that said that the that theory could be the cause of the fish kills. Wow. So 13 so what different that, theories. 13 different Potential, theories, almost right. all pollution related. And let me and say so, too, real quick. So like, I don't, don't underestimate what you guys are doing because I think I, we had anglers come in here and I, I can remember after a particular tournament on the river, low catch rates mm -hmm. and not even guys, not even filling a five fish limit. Right. And which was a you know predominantly a good fishery, and they're just losing their mind. I mean, they're they are cussing. They're and they're basically saying, "Look, we can land, we can land on on Mars and pull, bring back rocks, and we can do all this stuff, but we can't determine what's wrong with the fishery." Right. And so that, but that's how we can be sometimes as as anglers. But to to your all to your point, it's not you guys are getting paid. You're getting paid. You guys are really deep diving into this to try to figure out what is what is the source what is the thing and see that's what i'm saying too we don't realize that people don't they're out there fishing they don't realize the, the amount of time and energy is spent and work is spent the number of minds that are being put together to try to figure this thing out fair enough yeah i think it really comes down to just a lack of communication i mean mm -hmm. like generally speaking it usually is that a lack yeah. of communication when we talk about you know like the maryland like and like how they have talked about the potomac river and stuff and the biggest gap there is like no one's getting in front of, of the right. narrative and, and mm -hmm. communicating what it is and we in and, and prior episodes guys we've talked about like the department of uh, virginia wildlife resources their website and their email list is banging like they're giving out information they're keeping people up to date so for better or worse it's harder for rumors to start when there's information that's out there in the public and i remember growing up the shenandoah river there wasn't a lot of information mm -hmm. that even as a kid i could be aware of you had mm -hmm. to really dig for it and so rumors start mm -hmm. and then the rumors snowball and snowball mm -hmm. and that's mm -hmm. where it goes and this, this was the pro part of the issue is that without i mean the the game department is here to manage and now it's the department i'm sorry i cannot get no, ddgif out of my head <laughs> yeah, i never will i never will figure out yeah. how to say dwr yeah. <laughs> um, but there as we said there are wildlife resource management agencies out of way yeah <laughs> slow to change fisheries. they're gonna, they're gonna, they're gonna have to duck pay if they see you in that thing aren't they <laughs> can't waste the uniform <laughs> <laughs> um where did that go on so um but you, well, where so, you were at, there was 13 different So the theory. game department, yeah. the game department was, in many ways, was sort of handcuffed, right? Well, they can, we're they not can, even responsible legally yeah. for investigating fish. That's kills, right. They which no, seems counterintuitive really. yeah, to a lot of our right. constituents. They don't get that. Yeah, the Department DEQ, of Environmental Quality. Don Kane, who you uh, work with a lot. That's right. The DEQ is the legal authority in the state. So mm -hmm. we're subservient to them whenever a fish kill happens. They rely on our expertise quite that's a right. bit. Um, because there are a lot of people at DEQ that know a lot about fish. So Steve Reister's counterpart was Don Kane, who is a, a tr terrific man as well. Um, and the two of them worked, you know, hand in hand because He's of this, probably retired this relationship. Don is retired. But that's a good point, John. That, that's something yeah. else you don't realize. That's not in your <laughs> responsibility purview to, to yeah. do that. You got to, you're going to be able to give them good information and intel, but that's not your. your and I have, I have theories about that too. A lot of things. A lot of there were a lot of um, agencies, both federally and at state level, that managed fisheries and also dealt with pollution. And they were generally during the Reagan administration, they were separated in that era. Oh. specifically mm, okay not as a commentary about reagan because i think reagan was a great president but mm. i don't love that that was done hmm. and it was also when a lot of the scientists were taken out of the, the u.s fisheries and okay. broken off into u.s geological survey and other agencies so <laughs> if you get a massive fish kill like that is that still a state issue or does it become federal like how does that work and when does it go up the chain of command is it always a state if there's a mass if it was pollution let's just say randomly is it still always going to be a state issue or did it ever like get superseded to federal it will never not be a state issue because it's a state issue mm -hmm. and the game department would always be involved and deq would always be involved because the federal government is, has um, delegated authority to virginia to regulate pollution mm -hmm. and manage fish and so um specifically so there's you know the the, the us epa is the federal agency that oversees the Department of Environmental Quality, but only when, and then they, they review permits, they have to finally <clears throat> approve permits, that, but they've delegated authority down to the state level. That's specifically a methodology of, of um, that the, the clean, U.S. Clean Water Act of 1972 created. Okay, interesting. Where the federal government set up a pollution floor. They said no waterways can be dirtier than this. 
And they set up a method to test them and determine which ones are impaired, and they put them on an impaired list. And then the agencies are, it's incumbent upon the state agencies to create a regulatory system to return those waters back to what are called water quality standards that establish, that are make it fishable, swimmable, and drinkable. Those are the three standards. And that's a federal, that's a federal, um, that's it's federal law. And, but the authority is delegated in almost every instance down to the states. A few states, the US EPA is still um, regulating because the state had, didn't take the delegation or they were de-delegated. They didn't do a good job and they were taken, the authority was taken back. Mm -hmm. Massachusetts used to be one. Mm -hmm. hmm. That's really interesting. So you were saying, so there was 13 different theories. 13 theories. And then what, mm -hmm. so moving forward from that, what did they end up, was there ever, and, and I always said too, that from what I understood, <laughs> we're always looking for a silver bullet, like yeah. one silver bullet. This is the cause. And in a lot of cases, that's not well, the case. Well, the most but, common theory was that there is poultry in the industry. Is I mean, this, yeah. I'm just going to say it. Yeah, oh, yeah. It's, yeah, it's, it's a grill in the room, right? That's so everybody right. said, oh, it's the poultry industry, for, you know, for 20 years. They've taken a lot of hits. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and people kind of envisioned landowners or, or poultry growers dumping litter in the river. There was no dumping of litter in the river. Right. You know, there's nothing like that. There's no nefarious activity mm -hmm. caused the fish kills. Um, but that was one of the large theories. And so what about poultry manure? What would it be, right? So the question was, well, why them? And what would it be about manure? Um, and so that, that got dug into. Um, a lot of people said, well, what about Merck? What about Coors? What about, you know, old sewer treatment facilities? What about, because there were a lot of aging infrastructure. Um, what about this? What about that? And the question was, was this a local issue, a national issue? But uh, I think I became kind of a thorn in the side of the agencies because when I became Riverkeeper, I took it upon myself to um, make sure that this was in the press, mm -hmm. that it was not forgotten, mm -hmm. that we have had and we're continuing to have fish health issues on the Shenandoah that were not going away. Um, the, we lost an entire fishery and, um, I'm, you know, I understand that that was difficult in the outfitters. I think there was some friction between me and the agencies that was very real. Um, and it went on, I was so, such a pain in the neck that I got a phone call from the governor's office and he wanted to come to my house. Really? So governor Kane and his security and they came to my house and we had a fish kill task force meeting in my living room in serious? my bed and breakfast I didn't know about that. yeah wow. and so you know the guys with the earbuds and the black jackets and stuff roaming around and you're kidding me no town of 450 in boyce virginia so he came to my house and we talked and some had some outfitters there we had um you know don kane steve a bunch of people and the secretary of natural resources was there and we so, talked about the problem and and, and um governor kane said i want to help and he earmarked some money in the budget to support the fish kill task force research and huh. it shined a national light on it we were in the boston globe we were in la times chicago tribune it hmm. was in new york times i mean the fish kills here were were so mysterious and difficult um and, and um to understand the origins of and there were so many conflicting theories mm -hmm. there's no real obvious smoking gun mm -hmm. and uh and then and then it sort of died down you know the but the fish kill task force kept going they funded um, quite a bit of research uh, u.s geological survey really took on a lot of that research learned things about the fish in the river that uh, were were new discoveries anywhere including the intersex phenomenon trying to find the origin of the intersex phenomenon they tried then to tie contaminants in the watershed to find which ones had the most correlation to the intersex um, condition of the fish with the theory that things that can cause intersex can also cause immune function mm -hmm. problems. And um, if I'm asked, and I used to be asked fairly regularly, what I thought the problem was with the river was that, um, now this is not describing the cause of this, but mm -hmm. my belief is, and I believe after it being my job for close mm -hmm. to a decade to see all the science that was done and understand the fishery, it looked to me like there's an immune system problem in the fish, that the immune system function declines in the spring, predictably every year. Some Every year we have lesions in our fish, and um, but not every year does it rise to the level of having a fish kill. Mm -hmm. and, um, and when I went back into the records at the Department of Environmental Quality, I went back and I did a deep dive and looked at in microfilm, old reports wow. in the papers there have been lesions on fish in the shenandoah since the 60s wow and it's well documented and everybody called it spawning stress 
but I've fished every river, smallmouth river. I mean, I've caught smallmouth and I can't know how many states and three continents and they don't undergo spawning stress that causes development of lesions. So what do you think, John, on that? Because that's we've seen a little bit of that at Lake Holiday, too, and we're seeing it again. But so what uh, your experience with lesions, what do you contribute well, that to? Lesions, it's, it's just like trying to, <clears throat> Jeff trying to describe the smoking gun. It, when you, when lesion on a fish could be caused by such a myriad of, of mm-hmm. possible. First off, this, the fish is stressed from something. Mm-hmm. That, could be, that could be spawning stress. I mean, the fish could be stressed from spawning. Um, but you're not going to see symptomatic at a population level. I mean, mm. you see one or two fish out of a hundred with a lesion. That, that's nothing. I mean, that's right. normal. We were, we were getting 60, 70%. Right. And when you see 60, 70% of the population with something malady like that, an anomaly, then that's a problem at the population level. Does, that's do not people normal. Know, do people know what a lesion is? So, <laughs> so no, that's because it can come no, in, in, every, in a million different forms. I mean, you can see lesions when you know you you can see bruising on a bass's mm-hmm. jaw. Right. If you hit a bone, you'll get a little dark spot there. So guys above my head, there be a there's a photo attached of a lesion on a smallmouth, the one that we're talking about right now. This is the miracle of post editing versus doing a live stream right now. <laughs> but what's above my head right now is what we're talking about. These are it's just John looks up. <laughs> of course, but, I know. I, <laughs> I do too. I so it is a it's a thing that that really was renowned for the Shenandoah River. I remember mm-hmm. catching fish um, in the Shenandoah or with these big tumors that look like on the side of them. And I think yeah. that's what we're kind of talking about, about here. But they could be yeah, essentially, the, the, essentially the, the, the scales fell and, off. The first yeah. sign was a slight rise of the scales mm-hmm. and a redness underneath the scales. Mm-hmm. Then the scales fell off and then bacteria um, mm-hmm. took over. There were mm-hmm. several different types of bacteria that would colonize the wound. Mm-hmm. They would eat the, the flesh down to the muscle tissue. Mm-hmm. And then oftentimes a fungus, the final uh, step was fungal development. It looked mm-hmm. like mouse fur, gray fungal development would colonize eat all the dead flesh it was essentially the maggot of the water world ate the dead flesh and then a lot of times that fish would heal other times it would die Mm -hmm. and the scientists looked internally and while they had bacterial infections i mean one of the hot theories with that there were bacteria in the river that were preying on the fish and there was no doubt that there were a couple bacteria that were colonizing the wounds and causing illness but none of the fish that we sent to virginia tech and none of the ones that were studied by usgs actually died of systemic infection none of them Hmm. There so was no not, so you're systemic not infection related. in the wounds. There that lesion were, is not related to the mortality. No, it is related. Saying. But what, they were, what the scientists said that they were dying was the inability to osmoregulate. Like um, they were losing through because their flesh, they had exposure, a large enough wound to fresh water. Gotcha. They were losing their calcium and magnesium. They were losing the ions in their bloodstream. And it caused many of the fish to die of a heart attack. So Just like an anorexic stops eating. They, they're prone to dying of a heart attack. It's how anorexics die. It sounds like a black swan event specifically, and a lot of bad factors equal this huge suck uh, of an event. But yeah. one thing you talked about, like holiday, and I'm interested in your investigation, was there any correlation between like aquatic vegetation die off? Was there a lack of aquatic vegetation that helped filter the water system out that, that could have made this an issue? Was there any other things like off the wall that you noticed on the river? I've noticed a lot of different things on the river. Um, I change in aquatic vegetation for sure. Um, I mean, the last time I've seen heavy aquatic vegetation on the lower South Fork or on the main stem was 2002 at the end of the three year drought. And 2003 was a high water year, blew all the particularly star grass out and it hasn't recolonized in, in any significant quantity. But this, uh, that's another, I think that's, I separate this separate thing. because there are places that water is, you know, that the mm-hmm. SAVs came back. And this was widespread and appeared not to be in relation to those types of factors. Now, it could be a stressor. And mm-hmm. what the stressor that I'm thinking of is algal blooms, particularly harmful algal blooms. We documented gotcha. um, several species, quite a few species of blue-green algaes, which can produce toxins. We did not, you know, they just closed the North Fork last year, the Shenandoah, yep. because of a, a harmful algal bloom. <clears throat> they closed it to recreation, rec- recommended no contact um, on the North Fork of the Shenandoah. See, that, that always and fascinated me too, because it's it, such a rural area down there. There's no, there's no houses. There's no. I mean, there's some farming, but there's no. I mean, Strasburg's seen a little bit of development, but you go from like Woodstock, <laughs> Tomsbrook, Marietown, that hasn't changed in sixty, seventy years. So, no. so um, that the algae was something that I spent a fair amount of the latter five years of my time as riverkeeper working on, it included up to, up to and including suing the United States Environmental Protection Agency for failure to address, to actually for, a, it's a complicated way you have to sue the government. They, take, they, they let you sue them, but in a very specific way. Mm. So I sued them because they allowed Virginia t- 
to not put the Shenandoah on the impaired waters list for okay. new, for the mm, algae, algae blooms. That's right, because Virginia, I felt it was incumbent upon them to declare the Shenandoah nutrient impaired, impaired for nutrients, because what was happening was we were losing our SAVs, algae, you know, SAV would emerge, algae would colonize on top of the SAV, star grass would start falling apart. It basically interrupted either the photo and you know, the ability to um, uh, photosynthesize, mm -hmm. or there, or it was potentially also lysing cells on the um, in the grasses, and it was just you'd see them emerge, and the algae would bloom, boom, they'd die, and then they they'd either uproot or just break off, huh. uh, and then the algae would colonize, and you'd end up with just mats of blue green algae on the bottom. Stuff. Um, there were a couple different species that we found all the blue greens mm -hmm. they basically remind you like and they would colonize in areas where there was a solid bottom rock or bedrock if there was sand that moved it wouldn't really colonize you'd see some of it but the movement prevented it from because it didn't have a root it's not a root system so it's a complex layer of different types of algae mm -hmm. and it just looks like pudding so if you spread pudding on the bottom it would stay okay. where there wasn't a lot of flow and if there was flow it would wipe it wipe it out and it was kind of a brownish green pudding and then there was mats of bright green stuff. I mean, the, the colors I've seen the Shenandoah, I've seen it look like a tennis ball. I mean, there's crazy, yeah, yeah, crazy algae that. blooms yes. cycle through that river, different species. Okay. Um, and, you know, I believe we have a, a population problem in our smallmouth in the lower half of the South Fork and the main stem. These are also the places where we don't have grasses. Grasses are, and they perform a lot of functions that are habitat for young fish. Right now, you know, the river gets low after a spawn. There's nowhere for a fish to hide. They can hide under rocks and crevices right. and things. But those grasses are full of baby fish. The years where we've had really good reproduction since I've been around, 97, I watched the 97 spawn, um, then it was, which is after the 96 floods. Uh, 2004 and 2005, kind of ironically, were good years, even though the years we experienced the fish kills, 2007 and 2013. And we have not had a good spawn since 2013. So we're nine years out. We did last year have a killer spawn. Mm. So the fishing has, you know, if asked, like, why is the fishing decline? Well, there's a lot of things that cause a decline of a fishery. Mm -hmm. And then if they all come together at the same time, you end up with a, a fishery like we have. Mm -hmm. You know, the guides last year, in many cases, stopped fishing portions of the Potomac because they would catch no fish. I mean, fish for 10 Correct. hours and not see a smallmouth bass. Correct. Places where they would, you know, in the 80s and the 90s, they would catch 300 exactly. in a day. Mm -hmm. And it's all it's so the primary driver is reproduction, right? I think every yeah, the game department showed better. that a long yeah. time ago. Your fishery is driven by year classes, mm -hmm. and what does that mean? Okay, year classes. So 97, 2004, 2005, 2007, 2013, those are our big year classes where you had way above average spawn. Those fish are robust fish, they generally, my experience is if, if you ask me, I watched all those spawns and. I'm not going to tell you the date because I don't like to focus people's attention, but their spawn window was three days in those, in each of those years, it was the same three days, hmm. everything culminated. And so my experience has been, and, and, um, is that when we have massive reproduction, it all comes together and coalesces on the same, in the same time. And literally every male is on a nest and the males and females are all going through the you know, the courting, courting process on the same day. Really? All of them in a region. Wow. Literally. Hmm. When it's organized. And when it organizes like that, those are the years we have killer reproduction. Gotcha. When it, and it organized like that last year. That, that gets back to the thing we talked about earlier, the phenomenon is sort of when it's good, it's good. Right. And it, the recruitment in these cases does not seem to be density dependent. I mean, in other words, no, it, it doesn't matter how many young are spawn, no. nobody's lacking for resources at that time. Right. So when we also learned a long time ago that the flow is one of the primary drivers, mm -hmm. but in your experience, have you been able to discern other things in that narrow window, like maybe a moon phase or our mm -hmm. barometric pressure that would add it, it, it because because we know that the flow is a primary driver, right. but it can't just be flow. It's right? it's a number of factors. Right. And and during COVID, when I had nothing else to do, I graphed the I went back and I gave a presentation to the PRSC on this. I should share it with you guys. Um, I graphed the those windows, ninety seven, I went back and got USGS data, water temp, 
water levels and all the places that I know that I that I know with my eyes when fish spawn. Now there's a water level window that they like. Right. They don't like it to be too much below that, and they don't like it to be above that. Right. Um, when it gets too much below it, what happens is their spawning areas become um, too quiet, and they like pr- quiet protected areas to because they're a nest sweeper. They they sweep a nest. They basically uncover chicken egg sized rock. Um, they sweep away the fines, the sands and the gravels and the shells. And then you look in the bottom of the nest, it looks like a bunch of chicken eggs. And the eggs have are slightly sticky and they adhere to, if you have a rock and it's three inches around, they adhere to the perimeter of the rock. They're not on the dome, they're in the crevices. Um, they look like little sesame seeds and um, they're there depending on water temp. If the water accelerates in the 70s, they hatch quick. If it stays in the 60s, then it takes, takes three to six days and if it drops below 56 degrees, the male's abandoned. So if you go into that window and then it drops down, if the eggs lay, you know, are laid and the male's there and they're fertilized, you drop below 56 degrees, every time they'll, you'll wholeheartedly lose all your nests. And we lost them this year. We had an early, we had, a May, we had April 15th spawn this year and those males abandoned because we had a, we had a snow yeah. after one of the spawns. It was crazy cold. So, That's very, I mean, So it's I- temperature too. And That's, so, yeah, because all I was thinking about, all I ever thought about was flood. And like, and you said earlier too about low, flood? like flood, flood. like flood. Um, you were yeah. talking about right. drought. I could see now yeah. we're drought. So I'm, again, we talk about how much we learn mm-hmm. and I learn every time we do these things, drought as well as flood. But yeah. to your point now, that's really good information. That water, just the level and the temperature. So the river, if like, you look at a graph of the river, it's going up so and you're down. saying like our spawn class this year is, is not going to be no, good. No, uh, but we did lose the, the early you know, the, the big fish, the big, okay. big males sweep first, big females are grab it early. Um, and then when it's, when it gets shattered, when that first round gets shattered, okay, um, it just becomes disorganized and okay. you don't get a, cons- you don't you. get that it's whole, you don't get, good. it doesn't come together all at once and you'll get, re- as... you get reproduction, Okay, just but you don't as... get that wave of reproduction. I'm, I'm if you want one of those 97, you know, 2004, 2007, 2013 spawns, it all happened. Those years, gotcha. all the conditions come together, okay. and then it's like wham. And we, you can, if conditions the rest of this month are good, meaning normal flows, yeah, I think we could probably still have a good year class this year. Yeah, it might so not John, be epic. That's right. So it's okay. not only it's not I only are your are your babies getting born. It's are you are, do you have the flows after that? And the first thing I saw that indicated that they did a, a study on the Rappahannock the game department did showed that it was June flows had a lot to do with it. And June flows is when they're surviving, right? So if you have a big event in, in when the fry are very young, well, they're, once they eat their yolk sac, they're a predator in the system now. They're having to find food and eat it. And mm-hmm. a large fish, we saw this first in 96, can become kind of um, going to a torpor and really not feed in long, prolonged high water events. In, in 2018, we had the same thing. Fish really didn't grow that year. There was very little feeding. Um, and but those young can't they don't have any body mass you know uh, it's just similar to why a three inch you know you have to get to three inches to make it through the winter in a lot of uh, climates because they just don't have enough body mass to make it through without feeding they're not going to feed all winter. Gotcha. and so those young it doesn't it's not a very long window of time where those young just die from starvation if your water's cloudy for a couple weeks so in a lot of impoundments, they're site feed, they're site feeders a depth. lot of impoundments okay. they look at striped bass and they just say they cannot actually on their own sustain a breeding program and this is in a lot of impoundments uh, across the united states and so you have to do supplemental stocking at what point do you have to have a failure rate over 10 15 20 years where clearly the smallmouth in these in these certain ecosystems cannot self-sustain and we need to have a supplementation like what 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 point do we actually look at it that way I, i'm not i mean i'm not ready to say that we need to have um augmented stocking in the river but it sure wouldn't hurt um but like for striper like they do have a failure rate depending on so in, where in they the shenandoah can. when the when the conditions are right they they reproduce like crazy we don't have a reproductory problem so our what we have is a we have a weather problem mm. and what has happened is hmm. you know you, you might remember the march author. what do they say uh march roars in right in april rains may and uh, may what is it yeah. may flowers. flowers right well we're not getting april rains we're getting may rains 
And so I can tell you, I can, we can go back and look at the water levels. I mean, we're at like seven inches of rain already in May this year and the average mm. is three and a half. And that right. has happened so many of the last mm. right. 15 to 18 years hmm. where it hasn't rained in April. If you look at the old graphs, you know, if you go, you go back in the seventies and the, what's available, go back in the old USGS data, you get a, you know, your, your highest median flow is April mm. and then it starts to subside, right? As the leaf, as the trees leaf out, grass emerges, you get a lot of um, absorption of rainwater. You you move from uh, mesoscale rain events, which are valley wide, to you know to thunderstorms that lay stripes of water you know down through the valley, and so you don't get as many of these large rises in, in, in water level that mass that mess up a spawn. Um, but we're not getting those April rains. We're getting we're getting below average April or average April rains. We're getting above average May rains. So just as they're getting to their prime time either hmm. to produce young or for those young to weather and, and grow up in the system and get out of that they got to get to like an inch and then they're viable um, to get into that viability stage is when we're getting a lot of high water high muddy water and it's just knocking them out so it's not only just destroying nests you know the improperly timed either drop in temperature or high water event will just destroy the nest i mean those eggs are sticky but they're not really sticky um, they're stickier than largemouth, and that's why largemouth can and again, they lay eggs on a tree stump. Mm. I mean, and they'll stay, they'll stay there. They, but they're also spawning in currentless water, right? Mostly, um, mostly. <clears throat> small, <throat> smallmouth one point. We measured it. So we, mm. me and Vicky Placer went out and stuck it, stood in nests, stuck it, and took flow meters at various levels above the nest, and the optimal flow rate is uh, 0.03 meters a second. And you were saying that supplementation stocking would benefit or would not benefit. I think it's always a benefit, but we don't know how much you have to do to actually mm -hmm. move the needle on the catch rates. Mm -hmm. They, they did a, the, I mean, you guys did the Rappahannock study. Well, yeah. Remember, you, that was yours, wasn't it? We did the Rappahannock. Uh, we did the Stanton and one other one. Um, the problem was production, right? Smallmouth are really hard fish to raise. Mm -hmm. That's, yeah. And right now we don't have the pond space to do it. Um, we don't have the capacity to raise nearly enough fish to make a difference. Mm. And, and I, I, as I mentioned earlier, sometimes we buy fish from private vendors. Um, right now, there's no private vendor that's producing anywhere near the number of fish that we would need to stock in one river system to make up for multiple failed year classes enough for an angler would even recognize that something happened. To raise a smallmouth, do you have to like mimic the same environment they're from, like a, a, a river type environment, or can you do it in a pond? Like, how does that process work that makes them so finicky? Well, I don't think it's it's finicky actually getting them to spawn. I think okay. it, it's it's their needy in the early life stages in the okay. process. Is that the problem they're having? I, I, I'm not a hatchery person, so yeah. I'm going to take a pass on this one. Yeah, that's yeah, fine. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I, I Maryland, don't... Maryland took a swipe at it. They, yeah, you yeah. know, they, they've been collecting fish for a couple of years and trying to get them reproduced, and they're having a heck of a time well, getting reproduction. They've gotten some. They've had yeah. some successes, and they put those fish back in the river. Well, we, we've tried yeah. it. We tried it a number of years, mm -hmm. and uh, the numbers of fish based on our electrofishing average numbers of young of year per mile, you know, we calculated we would need – one of the papers, one of the papers that we did earlier, we estimated biomass and density, uh, number of fish per kilometer and, and biomass per kilometer of both young a year and adults, and so that gave us a realistic starting point when we're trying to figure out, hey, if you want to, you know, try to either supplement or recreate a missing year class in one of these rivers, how mm -hmm. many fish are you going to need to stock? Mm -hmm. And so we could put a realistic number around that with a confidence interval, and 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 we didn't even get close to that number of fish. So one of the reasons we chose the Rappahannock was a smaller system and would need as many fish to try to you know make maybe the needle move a little bit, um, but we couldn't even get the number of fish that we wanted, and even the number of fish that we got, um, they just weren't even showing up in our surveys. Interesting. And, yeah. Um, so. We basically tabled this notion of supplemental smallmouth stocking until more technology or more logistically, you know, facilities become available. This whole thing with with uh, Front Royal Fish Cultural Station and the improvements were supposed to happen there. You know, that was one of the things, sort of the pie in the skies, that w the ideas that we were looking at was having that be a major production modern facility to create, you know, hundreds of thousands of smallmouth bass fingerlings. Um, whether or not that'll ever happen it remains to be seen. Did you want yeah. to go into the front well, row thing? Yeah, and I remember because we with have talked before about Lake Holiday, you know, and, and what we found, and we've had, you know, we had the vegetation thing, too many grass carp put in, you know, lost all the vegetation. It's only changed the fishery. But what we found, John Reedy, you got to give him credit. You know, he he did. He was from Pennsylvania, but he, he now lives up here resident and has time to be on. He was on the fishery committee and 
and the board, but he, his research showed that, which I didn't realize this, but smallmouth lay considerably less eggs, fewer eggs than the largemouth. And then when we looked at the supplemental stocking, I swear he looked at two to 300 across the country, hatcheries, before he came across one in Ohio, Fender's hatchery, that that was able to you know, bring a small mouth. And of course he's, he's outsourcing too on different things. Walleye, he had some walleye and are all the other crappies raising large mouth and other, other small species. Mouth. And they, they were all other, they were raising large mouth. You were saying these hatcheries, like trying to find one specific to small mouth. That's what I'm saying. That so they were producing other species. Other, yeah. yeah. Other not species, just trout, but, but like not, they're doing other warm water species, yes. like large mouth and yeah. sunfish. But couldn't find the small mouth because we were looking yeah. specific small mouth. And so we're in our third, we do it every two years, third, you know, stocking, but, you know, to your point too, but see, we're in a lake too, so it's not quite as diverse. You know, deeper, you know, a little bit easier for them to survive. So we're still dropping the bucket what we're paying. We're spending probably eighteen thousand dollars every two years, and I, and I forget what our exact numbers are. Um, but anyway, to that point, yes, it's not. And I understand what you're saying. It's kind of like is it just a drop in the bucket, really, when you think about it? Is it really worth? you know the time um and it is it's a tough thing now mm -hmm. as far as the front row i don't know where they're at like i said i, I did hear that you know rumor they're wanting to get it started back up and there was you know questions well, there's, about there's money set aside to do it if i and i admit i've lost track and we should mm -hmm. we should have mark frondorf on the show so yeah currently the senator yep. keeper would have more current information or, yeah or, no, that'd be good or steve or one of his crew who would be up to date but mm -hmm. there was yeah. the idea that they were going to bring it back as a mm -hmm. warm water, possibly walleye, possibly musky, possibly mm -hmm. smallmouth. And there's NERDA money, natural resource damage mm -hmm. assessment money from the DuPont settlement, from the old mercury pollution that occurred mm -hmm. between 1929 and 1950. They mm -hmm. eventually monetized it. And it was monetized as a value of the loss of smallmouth fishing days or fishing days on the river, mm -hmm. not smallmouth. And one of the ways it was thought that they could augment um, and give back the lost right. fishing days, right. stocking, habitat improvement, you know, improving access to, to right. create more opportunities for fishing mm -hmm. and better fishing. So, so quick and question so, to you for you, John, and I know you're not the hatchery guy, but and you talked before about trout. So where, where does, so in the funds that go into, and I go, this is not your, you know, purview, but, um, you know, how does the state look at that as far as, you know, the trout stocking versus, um, you know, these other fish or species and what, kind of what goes into that? And again, I understand this is not your necessarily your area, but to your knowledge. Well, we've got we've got warm water hatchery system and a cold water hatchery system. Smallmouth, obviously, we're talking warm water hatchery system. Um, we rely a lot on more so now probably than we used to on our anger survey too. Oh. Um, we've got, we've got a new a survey and, and we're asking people, you know, our constituents, what, what are they targeting? Mm -hmm. You know, what you, so, so we can actually, we know now, you know, what percentage mm -hmm. of our anglers are targeting, you know, stock trout gotcha. versus smallmouth bass versus, and, and I can tell you largemouth and smallmouth are still the, the, the winners. Right um, mm -hmm. Yeah. They're, and, and they're, they're, and so that'll help justify improvements, you know, and, and upgrades, Gotcha. As, as we move forward, potentially, especially if we continue with these erratic uh, flow conditions, which seems to be exacerbating, mm. you know, our smallmouth populations in most of these rivers. There was just a recent pub a publication that came out. I can't remember the primary author. There was a whole slew of authors, but the, the primary author, and it was one of those, it was one of those, um, it was a peer review pub. Um, it was one of the Acelvia products, I think, uh, maybe rivers and something ecosystems, but it was, it was a highly technical major analysis of flow regimes in a lot of East coast rivers, mid Atlantic, and even maybe even North Northern Atlantic and looking at multiple primarily centarchids, sunfish species, mm -hmm. um, rock bass, smallmouth, red breast, and, 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 and the, the downward trends, in so many of these populations and so many of these rivers attributed primarily to just these erratic flows that, that mm. Jeff was referencing. Mm. The fact that, that, you know, just in the four years I've lived in Rappahannock, Battle Run near my house has had like three 500 year storm events. Wow. Okay, well, I'm not sure why they call them 500 year storm events anymore, <laughs> right? They happen every not year. Anymore. Um, yeah. So it's things like that, or the reasons, one of the primary reasons we're having poor year classes. Because the the, the the reproductive, the the life history strategy of the smallmouth, as Jeff is so eloquently described, is not suited to deal with that repeated five hundred year storm right. event. Um, so, hmm. yeah. I mean, so will it continue? That's the question, right? right? Are we exactly. seeing a decadal? Are we seeing a big change? Is this a climate change? I'm here to stay. Is this yeah. a change in the? You know, I mean, is this uh, as simple as? Um, 
El Nino, you know, mm -hmm. you know La Nina. Right. It, those yeah. those can affect we East Coast that. weather. Mm -hmm. Are we going to see this? We've seen it for 15 years. I don't want to see it for another 15 years. But right. how, how, what is the data point? Is it we have to wait 100 years before we say know. like it is? I'm really just curious. Like what what is it though? That's like, a good question. Well, we, years, we, so. I guess I've never done it, but I could go. We could go back as far as USGS data shows and see what mm. the long you know the longest tread, uh, window we have would be their data, a the flow data. But it would need to be pretty pretty detailed. You know, a lot of the stuff started in the 70s. You know, a lot of those um, those um, the gauges are really they don't go much back you know, back further than the 70s and so, so it's got to be over like 20 years for us like we this is the new I don't normal know. But, you know, we, had oh, damn good we had some damn good smallmouth populations in our rivers yeah. in the 80s yeah you'd yeah, have to just ask, you'd have to ask yeah, this, 80s and early 90s and you'd, and you'd have to ask a statistician how many years you have to go back to determine whether this is all a, a wave or a trend yeah. and it is interesting you know, though because in, and i i relate to what you're saying because i can remember early 90s floating the north fork and just just like phenomenal fish rates and catches yeah. and size and everything right and then to your point, yes, it, then it hit that. And it was like in, 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 on a smaller river like the North Fork and where it's crystal clear, even floating, even if you're not catching them, you're just seeing. There's things. no secrets there's, on the North Fork is what we always no, say. I mean, it's, there's, there's fish, here, they're see going everywhere to see them. And then it was like the Dead Sea. They were gone. And so yeah, here you talk you about those them. percentages. Yeah. Now, I will say, though, and in, in, in here, you know, see, we're seeing the pictures come across you now with, you know, social media and stuff. Man, seeing there was a 20... 21 incher caught mm -hmm. right above route seven, you know, mm -hmm. and they're, they're, they're weighing, they're back to weighing 20 pound bags and tournaments and stuff. So, I mean, that's, that's our, our fish are there. What's that? Our brood fish are there. Right. There's, so, they're there from the 13 class and possibly okay. still some left from the, right. the seven class. Mm -hmm. So, that's so there's fish, still, but, it's such a resilient resource though, too, where it, it, it is, you're going to have those down years, but <laughs> that thing, give it a couple years. And, it, and to your point, I guess, because the spawn classes, couple years and the food is there it bounces back and then you're talking about the memorable catches i mean you're starting to see that again so kind of to your point i go back to the cycle i've always i hear people, a lot of you know a lot of people are cutting i get it but at the same time just wait if we just wait enough wait long enough it, it should come back around i guess unless now there's, unless there's a problem again. Out again. It, right. when i joke with colby and brian trow from mossy creek okay. we say you know we joke about you know there's a month in the in, in the in the spring where hardly anything can live in the shenandoah and so um, if we can avoid fish kills, then it's just down to reproduction, right? right? So, you know, we need, to, we need to produce the fish and then they just have to stay healthy. Right. And then there's angler contribution and we can get into that's a whole other topic of con conservation. I believe, I, I believe very strongly that, um, that there's, a, there's mortality associated with deep hooking fish with soft plastics because okay. I see it okay. and I know it. Mm -hmm. And I think that it used to be the survey, you know, game department used to have a creel survey, like how many people, how many fish are people eating? Well, now it should be, well, if you caught a hundred fish, you probably killed three or four if you're using soft plastics, almost without a doubt. And, and, that, and that if is... you got, if you've got blood, I mean, the, the arteries in a fish run from the heart through the gills straight to the body. They don't go back mm -hmm. to the heart to be, they have two chambers and they don't go like we have four chambers, they, you know, and so it's going through. And, the, and if you look down in the throat of a fish mm -hmm. and, you, and you see that little you see what looks like it's the esophagus. It's the wrinkles of right. the throat, yep. right? Yep. If your hook is aimed yep. down, you're hooking one of their arteries. You're hooking one of the two arteries that feed their gills, which goes directly to the body, and they're going to bleed out internally. They're dead. So let's talk about two things. If, you're, if your fish is puffing blood when it comes in, and I've had fish where I can see when it jumps, and I was when I was a guide, I'd be like, damn, I can see the blood coming out of its gills already. Hmm. Should when, they be when cutting, it jumps? Should they be cutting the cutting that hook, cutting that? off and leave the hook in there i've heard i do not believe will, leaving the hook because it's a it's a it's a barrier of feeding leave. properly and what's going to happen is they feed they're moving that hook every time they you know they mm -hmm. feed around that they try to think the ability to move that hook it's imagine a, something inside you going like this yeah. i mean if you get an arrow in your side they stabilize yeah. it and then they take you to the hospital to have it removed right so you got now, there my, is stories though where it will and, and again i understand like, like it is not going to rust out the no, but it might so good pass today. through. Like I've had, I had somebody just tell a story where they, they kind of pulled it out, and again, that's because they ate, ate the bait. They ate it. They didn't right. get gut hooked. Okay. They ate it, consumed but it. But this was that, a hook, though. This was say a hook was coming out. Understand that that hook was in a bait that, 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 that they swallowed. It wasn't you. hooked into the throat. You. I'm following you now. So I do not like the idea I'm of leaving a hook in a fish. Yeah. Okay. Um, and there's a great technique for removing them. You stick your finger in the gill. Don't worry, mm. the gills are pretty tough. Okay. You actually go underneath the first gill. You take and you you put your finger over the line and the eye of the hook, uh. and you pull it out the gill, and then you push forward. So what it does is it rotates that hook from being aiming out of the fish's mouth. You rotate it like this, uh. and then you push it straight out. And 90% of the time, you leave that fish 
will not be bleeding when you're done doing that maneuver. And if you catch the artery, then you've then hmm, you're I mean, done. Yeah. You know, that's what we can do about it. I mean, Al Linder was the first person yeah. to advertise that, and it's saved. I've saved Is thousands of right? fish using that. So we Small, probably check that out, Al Linder. Maybe I mean, we should do. Yeah, there will be there will be a, be a link we, to a gut hook uh, video down below in the episode description. One thing it used yeah. to be people would cut the hook, and then I mean, I, I just think rotating it out is so quick yeah. and so simple once you master that technique. I wouldn't Real do it with a really toothy fish, but <laughs> and, and the idea too. The other thing I was going to say: don't let that happen by getting a better hook set. Like you know, and again, I know it's. It's inevitable once. It's in a while. inevitable once in a while, and maybe. When I was a guide, this is what I did, and not everybody will do this because I don't think I don't think everybody has someone yelling at them, <laughs> or, or it's hard to stop catching fish when you're catching them. Right. One gut hook. I would try to figure out what it was that he did. Was he was, he, was there too much limp line? Did he not identify the bite? Right. I would usually be able to identify a bite at or about right. at the same time the angler would. If they're not right. identifying, I would say you've got a fish on. Please reel down. Let's get it. Let's get it hooked yeah. before it swallows. But there are certain days, and it starts in May, where I, I call them like milkshake days. You know, when you suck a milk you milkshake through a straw, it goes right to your throat. You don't chew it. That's what they're doing. <laughs> they suck it into their. They literally suck it down, and it hardly passes the crushers, and it's in their throat. Okay. And it's it's instantaneous I see. And if you've got one of those days and it's not every day if you've got one of those days and you're throwing a tube which they love to swallow yeah. throw a jig and pig yeah they yeah. will not swallow a jig and pig right, right, right. the only time i've ever seen a, a small mouse swallow a jig and pig was a 21 inch male on a bed and it ate it it ate it gone mm-hmm. we were able to get it out that but they will is... not swallow a jig and pig if you're th- throwing a senko mm-hmm. go to a super fluke you know, mm-hmm. you're going to probably get a drop off if they're after the Senko profile and they've, they've been caught 27,000 times by a super fluke. I don't think anybody's fishing them anymore, but in the 90s and He's 2000s, man, I mean, those fish knew how that thing drifted down. They, they, you, know, you couldn't catch a big fish on a super fluke after about three or four years, mm-hmm. but they haven't really patterned the Senko is because I think there's less to look at, less to be um, bothered by. It's, I think it's, it's a, a less small mouth thing, too. I've caught small mouth from like Lake Erie, Tennessee, yeah. and compared to a large mouth, I would say I deep hook small mouth more, way more than large mouth yeah. like just yeah. per species mm-hmm. which i wonder how much that plays into it too they're just more aggressive well i think the education back before i'm, I'm just saying I'm, and i've fished with a guy that kind of like it's kind of like the line swimming away i'm like set the hook man like and yeah. I, i'm with you like and it's i guess a there's show. a, it can be a and, horror and, show like John's talking, saying it can happen it's going to happen the best of i had guys things. whose laps would be red from blood and i would yeah. eventually i mean I, this was early in my guide career before i mm-hmm. kind of felt like i had to take control of my boat mm-hmm. i just stopped allowing it Mm-hmm. I just said, let's not go hook anymore. This is what I need. You know, I'd like mm-hmm. you to do. We'll go through it, and then you know, if they were following the instructions, they usually eliminated the gut hooks. Not mm-hmm. always, but if we just had one of those days, either way, I had a guy who I call had ham hands, like his hands are made of ham. He could never feel anything. <laughs> There's people like that. No matter what you do, they mm-hmm. just can't feel anything, mm-hmm. and they can't see the line. Mm-hmm. You just got to get them off of the lethal base. You just gotta. <laughs> and if you're one, fishing and you're hooking gut hooking fish after fish. Mm-hmm. You, I know these fishermen love this fishery. We all love this fishery. Mm-hmm. You've got to have the discipline to manage yourself and come off those baits. Right. You've just got to come off them. Maybe go to a straight line bait, a chuck and wind bait, mm-hmm. you know, something that's a uh, slightly different size. Mm-hmm. It's got some, you know, put a weed guard on it so that they feel something so they mm-hmm. spend more time in the crushers. It's those really small profile baits that are slippery that they just go right down their throat. The Senkos, mm-hmm. the tubes. Uh, sometimes super flukes. If you give them enough time, they'll eat them. They'll eat them gone. I'm not trying to spawning, something here. The spawning but fish will eat them fast. Yeah, some of these newer rods. I mean, this, if when you go, and I'm not, I'm by no means am I trying to upsell, but Come on. but there is. I mean, there is sen- sensitivity. And I'm one of these two that never like bought into them. Like ah, I can catch one with oh them, yeah, like you the know. ugly sticks, man. Yeah, the ugly stick, raw man. In the world. I can, you know, can't break it, whatever. <laughs> but but I'm but when you go to that, like it, you can definitely tell yeah. the, the sensitivity. And all that relates to it too is you're gonna you're gonna catch more fish, but you're also, you know, once you do feel that they've got it, they're not putting it in their pocket or anything. I mean, it's in their mouth, so right. set the That's hook, right. you know. And on a river, bite detection is all it's about critical. line management. Mm-hmm. Right. That's what it's about. If you're at the, if you've got the right amount of slack or, mm-hmm. or you know pressure to your bait, you'll feel that bite. Mm-hmm. And if you lose contact with your bait, you miss that bite. Mm-hmm. And it's and about, I think it's it about line down management. To like the talented angler too. That's a yeah. huge thing. I mean, it if you had damage. like a couple of the bass masters compared mm-hmm. to Joe Schmoe's his first time out there, like I think the ratio of gut hooked fish would be would be mm-hmm. leaning towards one way. And it's something you don't no talk doubt. about a lot. No we doubt. don't talk about detection. You right. don't talk mm-hmm. with based on two the different lures that you're throwing mm-hmm. another thing that goes along with that too is in lakes deep deep water the deep fish with the bladder you know maybe mm-hmm. talk to that a little bit john like uh when you're bringing them up out of depths and then 
you know, that bladder, you know, the fizzing, I guess, or whatever, um, that, have, that can also deep enough that we do. Or? Yeah. We generally, we don't here, uh, Anna, maybe some stripers right. in winter, might maybe, um, Smith mountain, maybe. Yeah. It's, I don't, you know, deal, I don't deal much with fizzing as an mm-hmm. agency. Some agencies actually have like a brochure mm-hmm. okay. or recommendations for fizzing, just due to the nature of our fisheries here, we don't mm-hmm. and haven't seen the need for it. Is it mm-hmm. deeper than 30 feet? I, it, de- I think it sort of depends mm-hmm. on the system and how it stratifies. Okay. Um, there, it may be purely depth. I don't know. Um, I literally have no experience with it. So no. I don't know. We've that, seen a little yeah. bit up at Lake Holiday because it does. I mean, mm-hmm. it's 80 to 90 feet down the dam. So, I mean, it's mm-hmm. possible. And you, you know, Are 20, fish down that deep then? Well, 20 to 30 foot. Okay. I'm just saying you have that kind of depth. So, yeah, yeah we're not really catching that deep. But. Gotcha. 20 to 30 feet yeah you know it's not uncommon so when we and fished then, up at the st lawrence for a college tournament we fished down at kiwi down which is just above lake hartwell they told us about fizzing them because at the mm-hmm. time of year it was we mm-hmm. were catching spotted bass it was like 80 feet deep oh, plus yeah. and you were just you're just video game fishing mm-hmm. but it was you put them in the live well they would they would mm-hmm. flip right up mm-hmm. and so they told us before because we're all college because we didn't know any better but i didn't know if it was a cue of mm-hmm. either like you said is it, is it striation of the water columns mm-hmm. is it just because they were too deep I, it, that's it's probably just know. depth pressure mm-hmm. yeah that's any true to the in mountain the dew you heard about the mountain dew and you know pouring it down your throat when you back you're talking about the gut hook i mean they i yeah. swear for by what like, oh so if you make them barf fish, it'll make a fish barf that yeah but if, <laughs> if, you, if, you, if you take soda and you pour it down there it's to help the blood start like i guess like like cauterize the wound so to speak uh, well i can tell you this uh i learned this the hard way is that um so my mouth bass blood and probably fish blood doesn't coagulate in the air as fast as it does in the water. Interesting. Okay. That. Just doesn't. Right. So if you're holding that fish, mm-hmm. I mean, if you, I mean, there have been times where, like, if you hook a fish in the, you know, uh, where the tongue, mm-hmm. you know, the rakers mm-hmm. come into the tongue, mm-hmm. it, arteries right in there, it's under their tongue, mm-hmm. right? So if you, if you, and it happens occasionally, particularly with downturn hooks, and it happens, um, you know, with down t- turn hooks we use in the industry, mostly flies, mm-hmm. right? That are yeah, oriented like this. And you get a lot more tongue hooked fish with flies right. than you do with, with spin tackle. Mm-hmm. And it does occasionally get into that, into that, it, you know, this it looks like this and you get into that crook and you've hit, you've hit the jackpot, you've hit the ar- the main artery. Mm-hmm. And man, I would, I have, there are times where I've had a big fish, I'll stick my finger on it and I'll hold it underwater and hmm. it, co- it coagulates quickly underwater, hmm. but it will not in the air. It just seems to make sense. I mean, it, right. it's a, yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, it's a different, probably a coagulation process. Mm-hmm. I've never read it. I've never heard it, but I've observed it. Mm-hmm. So get those. You got to get this fish in the water. If you're doing some surgery and the fish is really blowing a lot of blood out, mm-hmm. you got to get it in the water. Hmm. Maybe that's what the Mountain Dew does. It expands, and maybe it's just the contact yeah. with water. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, that's the thing I was always mm-hmm. talking about too. Mm-hmm. But John, one question I had for you. Now that the snakehead is almost has a cult of personality around it, where you have Facebook groups and tournaments dedicated to it. Is there any change in the way it is viewed by the department now that you have more and more people saying like, hey, we actually like this thing? Or has has your view of them, the department, changed over the years or is it the same message? I don't think that a whole, there, there hasn't been any real shift in sort of the conventional wisdom of the leadership and the agency in deeming that it's still a bad thing. Uh, I think there's been an acknowledgement that relates to R3, which is a, a, an initiative that most state agencies are embarking on, which stands for recruitment, reactivation, and retention, I think, uh, essentially trying to maintain and increase the number of anglers um, just because without licensed anglers, then mm-hmm. <laughs> we don't exist because we're still a user fee funded agency, uh, one of the few left. and. If there was ever a poster child for R3, it's the Northern Snakehead. I, I've never seen people so excited about fishing uh, as, as I've, a lot of people like you just referenced uh, with just head over heels in love with getting in their kayak and going on a mission mm-hmm. chasing snakes. And you go on the, this is a zillion um, places on YouTube. You can see it and it, it's phenomenal, the excitement that it's caused. And, and of course, then you know, some might say, well, yeah, but but these are the, this excitement is creating people moving this fish and they're causing more controversy and alarm. Um, yes, that is happening, uh, and it's something we've tried to prevent by you know adding the snakehead uh, the same level as blue cat in terms of 
intentionally move and introducing it as a class one misdemeanor, which is a fairly hefty crime, uh, at least for how compared to what it used to be. Uh, but, um, you know, we, we don't want people moving fish, period. Uh, live fish should not be moved ever for any reason unless for, you want to take one home and put it in your pond. Uh, that's pretty much the only thing I, or an aquarium, that's the only thing I can think of. But, but in terms of you, an, an angler or constituent introducing a member of the public introducing a fish to another water body, a public water body, there's absolutely no reason for it. Um, if, if, if the habitat's there and, 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 hmm. and it makes scientific and ecological sense, we're probably going to put that fish there. So you look at how the goby has really changed a lot of those fisheries. Um, and at some point it's like, it's here, we just got to deal with it. Do you think that how much time will have to, to elapse before it's like the snakehead is just here. It's just a part of the ecosystem and we can't get it out. Like, or is it just going to be an on fighting war to try to eliminate it completely? Like what's the vibe there going forward? Well, we, so we're 20 years into it now in the, in the upper tidal freshwater Potomac, it was introduced in 2004. So we're, we're closing it on two decades. It was there for probably four years before we knew it. So I think we're safely at 20 years. But we can say, since I, I like to try to quantify um, the responses and the, the, the trends that we see based on discovery. So, okay, so discovery was 04. So we're 18 years. I think we've already seen the peak abundance, the maximum that we're going to see in this in these systems, what, what this fish can afford. Um People that would argue with me might say, well, the blue catfish took, you know, 30 years to reach peak abundance, which I think we've already seen that. And I think that's on its way down um, to that. I would say, well, how, what's the maximum lifespan and the maximum size of, between those two species? You know, for the snakehead, the maximum lifespan is probably 10, maybe 12 years. Blue catfish, you're probably talking 30, 35 years easily. Um, max size, you know, you're talking maybe 20 pounds versus 150 pounds. So we're not talking about apples and apples. Mm -hmm. We're talking about apples and something else. I, I just don't think, based on what I've been able to discern over the years with snakeheads and observing them, that we're going to see uh, an, an insane abundance. Like, like initially it looked like might happen on the Potomac, but it, it, it didn't. It, it's topped out. And so between the assimilation and exploitation factors, I just don't, I don't see it you know, reaching a level of, of a nuisance status or, or of ecosystem interference status uh, in the systems where it is now, you know, it could end up in a different system. Um, but, you know, barring a threatened and endangered fish in a system that it would do well in, the snakehead would do well in, like a coastal plain swampy type system, mm -hmm. uh, you just don't see that fish doing well in the habitats you know, it shows up in, in trout streams now and then, and it's gone. It doesn't do anything. That's, that's been going on for 15 years. Um, hmm. it, it, it migrates into a system on an apparent, you know, pre-spawning migration, range expansion, whatever, uh, and then it's gone because it doesn't like that habitat. Mm -hmm. It likes slow water. It likes silty, sandy bottoms with vegetation. It doesn't like high gradients. It doesn't like cobble. doesn't like boulders. Um, uh, so if, if, if it, if it's not in its preferred habitat, it's, it's, it's not, gonna it's not even really on the radar. Now the, the world record is out of Fredericksburg, is it not? You it know? is. Where is yeah. it at? Fredericksburg. Uh, it's either yeah. quiet, yeah. quiet Creek or snake. Potomac Creek. Cool. Yeah. And, and that's why I can and, almost see it's like a storyboard where it's like the beginning was we have these terrible sci-fi movies that's going to kill your dog to 10 years from now. Like the government's promoting like this is the world class snakehead fishery because people are going to travel from all over. And it's just such a weird arc yeah. that we're getting there. And you're starting to see it where there are Facebook groups like, well, oh, yeah, you're going to see it on menus more and more. I believe you'll yeah, see it too. on it because it is. I'm not the good. game department and I've become pretty fatalistic about the fact that we're just going to have everything everywhere at some at a certain point they're right. all going to get mixed i mean all the species are going to be everywhere it's the it's the arc of time right now that we're looking at yeah, I mean, 160 years ago william shriver put smallmouth in the potomac system now we got them in germany they're in south africa i caught them in the in the breeder river in south africa i mean they're going to be everywhere mm -hmm. they're nailing the they're wasting the native population there the, na na the native you know the, the south africans hate them we love them they've been here 160 years right. 160 years will they mouth. love them in south america when south africa yeah. probably because they won't have the memory of the yellow bass that they're replacing and so this what has been your public service now <laughs> we all live and we all die Good i get night. to take unpopular <laughs> opinions I, I don't know i mean we're gonna have we're gonna have flat we got flathead coming up the potomac yeah. they're whacking away pretty good at the 
They're, it's the to talk grass. about additional pressure on smallmouth recovery right, while they're right. eating young smallmouth and to some degree they're eating sunfish to some yeah, degree more predation yeah and it just slows recovery of the smallmouth what are your thoughts yeah. about uh like i think eight pound like a, i'm talking about records like a state record smallmouth was out of the new river back i think in the 80s donnie it, eaton it caught it eight in 2003 was it registered march, march 12th was it registered I, believe. I got to see that fish in the tank That's in the, cool, yeah. the bait store was it registered yeah that's the one, eight one, and then a kid caught it. Eight one, okay, yeah, yeah. Okay. The kid caught it, yeah. Donnie, gotcha. so the that previous was record was, was uh, two thousand three, and, and so, out of the new, out of the new. And yeah. I did hear that. Then he caught it on the bank, and then a kid caught it about ten days yeah. later and brought it in. It was the same exact. Way. Is that right? Caught it on a minnow at the so, campground across the river. What? Uh, <laughs> where? where <laughs> if that. it does, it is broken. Where will it be broken? Smallmouth in yeah, Virginia. Yeah, smallmouth. It's a new river. <laughs> yeah, still. Probably. Although, later, maybe. Did you see that fish that uh, that fly rod caught fish? That um, the James? up in the Upper James. Yeah. Uh, no. The plain chocolates client uh, caught. No. It's the second time or third time he's caught it over wow. the course of four years. That's My next I'll question: show you a picture. If that it fish is was twenty five and a half inches, and it How was long? enormous. It looked like a tadpole. Twenty five and a half inches. Wow. And they Holy they smokes. and they caught and released it. They released it. Now we did see one that was two ounces shy of the state record about 10 years ago with the Thompson Wildlife Management. Front roll. <laughs> yes, I heard about What's this. What's it even doing in there? Well, think about it. Before, before <laughs> that. Trout? Yes. We, that's, talk about we have long doing, said, yes. if like, you want to grow trophy bass, trout, right? yes, feed them rainbow trout. Yes, thank you. And, so, and yeah. we actually want to do that, but we get crucified <laughs> by our trout anglers. Did you hear about the muskie they caught down at Little Falls in the Potomac? Uh-uh. It was like 38 inches and 42 pounds. It was eating shad. They caught it oh. in the shad migration. Was it like square? It looked like a, yeah, it looked like a keg with fin coming out the back. And I love the, how you mentioned that, though, because when you guys, when you guys dump trout at Wilkinson Lake in Winchester, I'm always there with my Huddlestons because that's I've caught a six and a seven pound largemouth out of that pond because when they stock, they start feeding. A little rainbow all tub. Yeah. Trout swim bait. Yeah. Clear Brook. Like all the, the water here that are stocked with trout, like they're <laughs> fat. They're, I can show you pictures. Yeah. Yeah, the Their girth is, and that's because because they're eating trout, yeah. and I love there's it. There's going to be some seven inch, eight inch runs in every load. And but why? And, and I understand the, a, a stream, but, but a rainbow trout fisherman on a stream versus a lake. But here's the cool thing about it: like, too, you catch the trout, you're going out for trout, you throw it in the frying pan. But the ones you don't catch, the bass are eating, and everybody loves catching that big, fat, largemouth. I mean, I'm sorry, it's a win-win in my mind. But it's an expensive four species. I mean, yes. It's easy for me to say. <laughs> yeah. But but what I'm saying though, which is not a four species, it's still some people are targeting that. They're going they're going there to, to fish but and catch trout. I, I don't know if you read like that's why California was frustrated with their kokanee program it's because because yeah, they were it, dumping yeah. kokanee in these lakes and they were creating these massive small they, these spotted bass like mm -hmm. these world spotted records. But they're also spending a ton of money on this kokanee right. program. Right. No, I understand. You know, all right, I, heard you, I heard you mention spotted bass twice now. We yeah. got we got to squash uh, that. Okay, yeah. you want to start with that one yeah. too? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, like so. I guess it's so. Uh, my buddy's catching hybrids on the new and uh, in sandstone. We're really? also talking yeah. about uh, gas is going to be the hard hybridized Kentuckys, I think, aren't they? We genotyped a bunch of them. There's a bunch of mutts that have that have smallmouth spot in what? Alabama in them. In three where? Where he's because he's on the New River. The he's New and Wisconsin. the James. Now. Are you serious? So, right. I, I, you want to, so we'll set this up. So basically, there's a Kentucky bass invasion. I know it's like the the James and New, but the ones I've heard about is also Kerr and Gaston. Yeah. And the rumor is people have been stocking them in there because of the blueback because they're trying to make the heart well of, of this basically of Virginia is kind of the quote unquote what I've heard from bass anglers. Um, to you know, the floor is yours. What, what's going the, on? The, the problem is, 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 is we, again, we don't want people moving fish. Mm -hmm. Well-intentioned bass anglers think that they're going to catch more bass if they stock spots. The problem is, number one, it's already been documented. The spots outcompete largemouth and you end up with a whole lake full of small spots. Mm -hmm. So if you want to go out and catch a hundred bass in a day and not one of them is going to be over a pound, then, you know, okay, illegally stock spots. The other problem is a lot of this people, they think they're putting spots in, they're not. They're putting either Alabama spot hybrids in or they're putting in pure Alabamas. And what's already been documented in multiple states, we're having a symposium at the Southern Division AFS meeting we're hosting in February about how spots are screwing up the whole Southeast bass fishery. Mm -hmm. um, they're screwing up smallmouth because they're interbreeding. They're screwing up largemouth because they're out competing. And so we could actually have in our smallmouth rivers, the Rappahannock, the Shenandoah, the James, the New, we could, we could lose our entire, we could lose the entire face of smallmouth bass. They could be gone and we'll end up with this weird mutt. that's it's a third 
smallmouth, a third Alabama, and a third spotted bass. Could, could you talk about that hmm. for the people at home that don't understand it? That the, that the, sm- the spotted bass even in the Alabama River and the spotted bass are in California that grow to be like a thousand pounds, those massive ones. That's not the same one that's necessarily being introduced. No, no. There's, they're just different species or they're hybrids of different species and the way they're hybridizing with our species, mm-hmm. they're creating something entirely deficient. And, mm-hmm. um, Where are they seen in the James? Upper? Upper James, yeah. Great. Yeah, um, I think they were George Palmer's fish. So that would be... Buena Vista. Yeah. Buena Vista. Maybe. Um, yeah. I, I mean, it's it, it's a real... I mean, it makes it, it kind of dwarfs what blue cats and snakeheads are. I mean, it, mm. it's just... It could be a really, really bad thing for bass fishermen. That's depressing. So, I mean, that goes to, too... I know that's what we do at Lake Holiday. We run everything through the state. So, like, when before we stock anything, we're... we're basically getting the permitting uh required by the state and getting that signed off which comes with also health papers from that hatchery right. that says that because we don't just buy fish from just any anywhere well, making sure that there's a clean small mouth right well we're doing small mouth we're doing what we did walleye and we did a black crappy last okay year. but you're not so, stocking other no not not, not, size, not crazy, but as we look at we right. you know we we're tossing around the florida strain you know i the, wouldn't do that um why not well, you, so you're stocking smallmouth, which tells me it's a cool water lake. Mm-hmm. Florida Lake, hot water. I think Florida. What about Lake Frederick, though? My challenge to that is Lake Frederick's got some. They mean the Florida's. Lake we own? Lake Frederick? DGI? Lake, lake Frederick, right here, yeah. Does it not? I think it has a northern. I, th- I think that I was think stocked. Stocked. I can't catch a bass there. I think, so I I I think that's one of the lakes that was more recently stocked and maybe in the stock with F1s or potentially even in a, a very small window of time when we did experimentally try pure Floridas. And and because of that, the allele percentage is skewed towards higher Florida. So but well, my question is, my, like my, my thought, because it goes back to what you're saying before, and this is good. I love these discussions mm-hmm. because it's I'm all about the information, knowledge, and educating myself. And, and maybe the why, but so like 11 pounder caught last year out of Lake, Lake Frederick. So that, that potential, that genetic potential. Yeah. Okay. So now, and I realized too, in the problem of Lake Holiday too, we're, we are a little bit farther North. It's colder. It does freeze over. So you're not going to get the same growth rate. You're paying more money. I get all that for potential for, you know, bigger bass. And I'm not saying it is the right answer, but it's, it's a discussion that comes up. Is it like they can't go past the Mason Dixon line? Are they Southerners? No, like, what is that? Like, it's, it's for just, the Florida? It's just that they're not programmed for cold winters. So, they, right. so they don't what do as well? When, it, like, because I know they stocked them in Tennessee, but that, that is Southern. So, like, at what point you're, is you're it? You're talking like, pure Florida? Yeah. Like, at what point is it like, okay, this is too cold? Just, so it's not the best bang for your buck. Is you can look at yeah. degree days. I mean, there's different ways to quantify, you know, growing season. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's, I mean, it just trial and error. They, they just okay. haven't worked well. Hmm. The few pla- the few places we tried them, I think Germantown, I, I can't remember, if it was before I was here, but I think Germantown might have originally gotten pure Floridas. And, but I think and that was symptomatic sort of of the general scenario where you had the potential for an 11, a 12. Uh, but more hmm. often than not, you had you had a lot of what appeared to be stunted. You had a huge stockpile of, of 9 to 13 inch fish. Mm-hmm. And it was just almost seemed impossible to alleviate that. Hmm. Because anglers aren't going to, no matter how much you tell them, we'll keep somebody small. <laughs> yeah, eat them. Help, they, <laughs> they, they, won't, they won't do it. Yeah. Um, and, and, and I'm talking, you know, catch rates of like 200 fish an hour. You know, just an extraordinarily high catch rate. And Germantown's still like that. Um, I don't think the stockpile is as bad as it used to be. But. Um, that that was symptomatic of, of of a high Florida alleles, if not pure Floridas. Hmm. Um, that that stockpiling in, in apparent poor growth or inability to sort of work through a bottleneck. Interesting. Um, hmm. Yeah. I, yeah. Yeah, and I would want to do more research too, because then that's the thing. Before you do anything, you want to definitely ask the questions of the to the right people and and research it and make sure. And obviously, forge too. I mean, obviously, you want to make sure yeah. that that will yeah. withstand that. You know, but um, and I understand the data points. Like I've heard before, like, well, it's too cold. Like, what is the definition of freaking cold? Because Tennessee, right. Tennessee right. gets cold. Right. North Carolina gets cold. Like, at what point is it like it right. is actually like this is not the best? Because condition. in our private setting, we're kind of like listen to you. Like, we're it's our constituent base too in a private setting, and yeah, it's not it's not public water. But as as we've raised money and we're going to stock it, okay, what do I want to put in? I hear like some guy, oh, I want the crappy. I want the crappy. This guy wants trout. This guy wants smallmouth. This guy, and the smallmouth is predominant species that everybody wants. Walleye, like, yeah, they're going to be good eating. We had great growth rates in two years. I mean, they're pumped. They went from five, six inches to, to 17 inches, you know, in two years. So, what's your forage there? Um, alewives. Right. Um, How many acres is they calling? It's, uh, I don't know if I've ever set eyes on it. 
I want to say 250. Dude, you got self-sustaining ale wise? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And they were there forever? I mean, did somebody stop? Uh, that I don't know. <laughs> that I don't know. Wait, wait, just tell me. I don't know if I that. fish population. Um, it's 150 feet at the dam, right? Yeah, about 80 to 90 feet. <laughs> um, it's a great... And the state does come up. Halikers come up. Uh, Reachers come up. Uh, they do about every two to three years. They'll do and you kind of a shock study. You have oxygen below the thermocline mm-hmm. in the normal summer? Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's, that's so, I mean, it, it's a great fishery. Yeah, a I mean, at deal. the time, too, the smallmouth, were, it was just... You know, really great, but it that kind of died off. It's not eutrophic yet. But didn't they also have like a massive like grass kill too? Yeah, like we had the others? grass kill. But and so, they, but what we're talking about too it goes into management, which I think is pretty cool. Like whether you're doing quality deer management or in this case a fishery management, and that's what you guys do too. That's what you're oh, kind yes. of paid to do. You're managing a fishery and but and weighing like what people, what those constituents want, and what's going to be best for that you know that resource, that body of water. So, How much it's, management it's, are you guys doing of fisheries? You know, it used to be, well, I, mean, I asked it, I asked yeah, it. No, John's way. like, that's on, my job. Let me, let, me, let me be more Jeff, clear. Jeff, you need to watch our first it, podcast. And, and it <laughs> used to be that you would set creel limits and that was a primary management tool, gotcha. right? Order, pe- people are eating everything, so let's limit what they eat or put a size limit on it or whatever. And that's really kind of gone, right? That may, that strategy's gone. People are really not eating the fish like they were. It's more that's about an interesting concept, So too, what, yeah. how does, what creel, face does management take So, now? Hmm, So limits. Harvest regulations, whether it be a, a bag limit or a size limit, which it would include a slot limit or yeah, minimum yeah. size, those are only useful, at, typically used to restructure a fish population mm. based on anger harvest. Gotcha. If you take anger harvest off the table, which in many cases it is in this right. day and age, that's what, that's what I'm saying. with that's almost right. all black bass fisheries, right. be they with smallmouth, largemouth, whatever, um, and a lot of wild trout fisheries, um, trying to think of other primarily catch and release, then th- that management option is gone and is, is meaningless, is useless. That's one of the reasons mm-hmm. I had disagreement with Maryland early on about about wanting to put further restrictions on s- seasons and tournaments and mm-hmm. whatever, sizes. Uh, it just didn't make sense because we know that fishery is over 99% voluntary release. Mm-hmm. So if, if, if anything is meaningless that you try to ask the angler to do to help you re- change something because it's not significant. Um, even but, even limiting spawn during spawning your production yes, be, if, if be, necessary because i agree in in most of the evidence in the southeast us with regards to black bass whether it's largemouth or smallmouth would dictate that that recruitment is density independent meaning that the conditions are more driven by environmental I, so I, if, there's if, no doubt that if it's good it's in my good. mind well, i'm going to disagree in part partly because there's no doubt that the production of fish and the survival of those fish through the young you know, through year one is environmental. And then it becomes an angler issue. And I know that if you pick a fish up off the nest and relocate it, it's fish or it's young or dead. Right. It's young or predated. So you're just, it's a, just a numerical issue. If we're talking about your classes are being what constitute our fishery and you're numerically eliminating fish one by one by removing a nesting fish, you are numerically reducing its reproduction and you are numerically reducing that year class. It's just mathematically causing an impact to that fishery. Now, that being said, I'm not, I'm not preaching about not spawning, but the reason I asked you about how much management the game department is doing, I think that we're moving into an era where the fishermen are more responsible for managing their resources, like Jake's Bay and Tackle and Lake Holiday, right? Like the, the people who fish the rivers need to really take the responsibility for their management. They need to know what their population of fish is, mm. when it's time to leave, lay off of them, when it's time not. The Shenandoah River, when there's strong reproduction, I mean, there are so many fish in that river. Then it needs a little pressure during the, the spawn. But there's also, was it just, we were coming out of a period where we had 10 years where any angler effect on the on the spawn could have a big impact on what was produced in that river. So we I'm already a, had very few fish. I'm going to so. play devil's advocate to both of you. Cause so yeah. one, I think it's cultural. I think you're, we grew up in an area where my dad was here. He kept a shotgun in the car after high school, you go hunting. Nobody yeah. understands the outdoors here. So when you go down to like Texas fishing game, those people that grew up in there, there's a culture of, of the outdoors. And so you have a people that can better husbandry their resources because they know it because the fishing game and then the culture they grew up in help provide that to the next generation. Mm-hmm. Up here in Loudoun County, we have people that fly in from California that have never even seen the river before. And they, <laughs> they want to go on a float trip because they think it's amazing for their Instagram account. Those people don't understand the culture to husbandry. So I think it's a, a, a dual sword yeah, on that end. That on, on, on your end, I saw what Marilyn was talking about doing the catchweight release. 
I would say that, that that I don't like that as much, but then you look at Lake Fork, and that's basically that is the most micromanaged lake in the world, and that thing just pumps out kickers even when Bassmaster comes there every single year. So I don't. What is the right answer there? Because like, what apparently they're doing at that lake is working, but can we simulate that in different fisheries? I don't know. Where is Lake Fork? Texas. Okay. It's I, I think what the we, number one pressured lake in the world besides Lake Biowa. Well, I look at Pickwick. I mean, I, there's Pickwick, certain species also can't but, handle the pressure in the same but way. Pickwick, I think smallmouth are more prone to the pressure Pickwick because of their is, inconsistency yeah, in reproduction. But Pickwick is catchway release. You cannot put fish in the live well unless it's like over like uh, like a like an eight pounder. And when, that's why bass has to adjust it and actually do the catchway release. When was that there. instituted? Because that smallmouth fishery was destroyed between the time that I fished it with Steve Hacker, who was the original Lake guy there in 2000. Pickwick? What are we talking Pick, about? Pickwick Reservoir. Oh, Pickwick. Pickwick, okay. the, the tailwater to Pickwick, okay, which was yeah, the, yeah. you know, they were catching consistently eight and nine pound fish, smallmouth in there, unheard of large fish, and it was destroyed. There are, it's for, it's, it's a striper fishery now. Hmm. And Steve Hacker showed me the three places that those fish spawn. And I said, what's it like here in his spawn? He says, well, there's five tournaments a day. They, re, they mm -hmm. weigh them in at the other side of the lake and there's 25 boats in each of the spawning areas. And so I just know, I just know numerically uh, you well, know, that, point, that you're, you know, you're going to have a major impact. And they eliminated point. the smallmouth in lower Pickwick. Mm -hmm. Below the below the, the dam, it's but just become a striper fishery. I would argue in Virginia at this time, <clears throat> excuse me, based on what we've seen, I don't think that the bed fishing or seasons are needed because I don't think that the pressure is adequate enough to change mm -hmm. the strength of a year class at the population level. You you, you know if on, you the, may, on the upper on the upper rivers, yeah, I, that may change. But now I'll say general. let's stay tuned because <clears throat> if it does change, I mean angler knowledge is improving. They're right. you know, like the Susquehanna, I believe, is an example where I do believe they're affecting the they're, the anglers are good. They know where they reproduce. It's not a secret. Well, and there's 10 and they boats. did. They closed that season. Yeah. They closed smallmouth. And for what that, happened? For, Boom. But, but to his point, returned. though, to his point back, I remember because I kept thinking, too, we were talking about the Shenandoah fish kill. And then, then the Susquehanna had the same thing. They followed mm -hmm. the Shenandoah mm -hmm. like two years later. They got slammed. And then the other thing. Slightly different issue they were losing their young not their but, right but their the susquehanna also class. went to catchway release it, yeah. but it the also tournaments. but during that time though that's what i'm saying though is to his point it wasn't the the, the fall of that fishery because i remember because i remember going up there and it was just hammering and then all of a sudden same thing light switch and it, it just you went through these dormant seasons now now to your point i like i like these healthy discussions because it's all different different mm -hmm. opinions and what is same type of thing does it go back to the, what's silver bullet but I know a lot of these guys, these tournament anglers, and they've been fishing this. And these guys, some of these guys are 75, 80 years old. They've been fishing that river, you know, since they were knee high to grasshopper. But you're talking about pressure too. But I just, what I've seen, I've seen those years where again, 20 plus pound bags winning a tournament on the river and then, and then a slack time. But then right now, like again, it's coming right back. And the same, those same anglers that were cussing in October because, because it wasn't producing on the main stem. And he and he's just I mean he's livid right and it's like then that December though I see a five pounder caught I see a four pounder I see a couple three pounders and I'm sitting here thinking those fish were there all along same same stretch they, those fish were there they just mm -hmm. weren't being caught and so and what's I'm learning too from just listening to you guys is again the environmental factors now I would say and again I think it's going to be based on percentages a percentage of environmental percentage of deep hooking it fish kill whatever yeah it's, it's all there's then, there different dials and the yeah. dials get moved and then everything has an impact yeah. kind of like lake holiday even right now too like it, it went into a different when that grass went out those fish had to go out and chase it and those alewives are out there and they're out now and they're out in that 70 foot of water now they're at 70 foot they're 20 foot suspended and that's harder for for people to catch there's ah, it's not you know whatever and then we had a, a slight fish kill up there but right now i'm hearing really positive things and we're seeing positive like better fish health they're bigger you know, so, you know, I don't know. It's one of those things. And back to your point, and some can say, too, that catch and release mm -hmm. was detrimental when as far as nothing was being taken out. And that that those groceries in the population, if it becomes overpopulated, well, that's going to stunt the growth, too. So, I mean, the key with all this now is finding the right balance in the ecosystem. And how much do we play a role? How much is it naturally happening? I mean, that's kind of like, I think, probably the... 
it comes out it comes down to just educating the public and mm. it's not the people that are just like make me that literally yes. reads every single tournament thing that happens every week it, right. it's it's the joe schmo and i keep i i said the story like i think twice now but when i used to go to like anna with a friend and they would just dump pesticides in the water to get the grass mm. away back when i was a kid because they're like oh it's a ve- it's just it's a weed it's bad mm. and it's like no that's part of the ecosystem mm. you need to educate it but it's the same thing like think about sharks it's like spray you know, for black back fly in jersey shore Maryland. ocean city Basically, back killing. in the 90s killing sharks killing was a big deal Right. And now over a twenty year educational period, like you don't just even didn't. touch a shark. They think right. that this this important thing. So if you educate the public, Correct. you can actually it's help the images. whole organization. And what Thomas is saying, I think Jeff has done we've done a good job where like again, so we're posting, we're posting social media, and of course everybody likes the five fish, you know, they're in the picture and it looks cool or whatever. Well then, you know, I'm I'm hearing this stuff and I'm thinking, well, so and we're and we're not, we're very independent from the standpoint where whether you're a weekend warrior, or you're weighing five and you know, having fun competing you know, each to their own. Um, But at the same time, like you're saying, the education of like, hey, and I think this is where we want to be too. During this period of time, let's be, just understand what they're doing, the fish. And if we want to make sure we have a good fishery moving forward, this is a critical time in their life cycle. So let's not wait, let's not hold five up in the thing. If you're going to catch it, five different pictures. If you're going to catch it, take, you know, but even get it, you know, get it back in the water quick and let it get back down there, protect the fry if that's what it's doing, you know, type thing. Just try to be a good, same thing, be a good steward of the fishery and be smart about what you're doing to try to just, you know, protect that, what we're, what we're going after, you know, which is that fish. There's there's no one answer to it. We had a fish kill in the Shenandoah and I didn't advocate for. Um, for catch and release, I didn't advocate for any change in regulation because we had right. great reproduction, but now we don't have great reproduction. I haven't decided to advocate for right. catch and release period, but we may one day. Yeah, no, that's and, right. Um, given, you know, there, we did that at Lake Holiday when we started seeing weights go down and it wasn't, we weren't catching the rates and stuff and we didn't, we couldn't put a finger on it. But we were we had been we were doing some tournaments and stuff. And to your point, yeah, and there was there might be there was some little bit of mortality, you know, percentage yeah. of mortality. And we're like, and we we don't want to do that right now because mm-hmm. because we didn't feel like the the health was there in that fishery. So we Smart said let's, management. let's pull back from that. Let's not do that. Now we might come back a little later and you know do something like that. But uh, but I think in bass and these tournaments mm-hmm. too. The other good thing I, that I appreciate, Jeremy talked about one of our young kids. One good thing too about them, to what to your point, these anglers they do care about fish care. I mean, they're, they're, they're serious about it. You know, there's going to be some mortality. They've come a long way, you know, with aeration and different things. And I think most anglers are on board with that idea. We don't want to kill. You 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 can see it break their heart and they hurt a fish. Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. Literally. People get banged up. Yes. Especially a smallmouth. to your point. Like it's like, man, you're you're like, Oh my gosh. Yeah. John, I have one question. Um, circling back to something that we talked about earlier. What are the pros and cons of using grass carp versus aquatic mowers? Because you see up north in a lot of those big fisheries, they use those things. Is it is it something to do like why why is it that they use it versus other places in the south don't use it? Like, could you talk about that a little bit if you have any experience with those two things? Yeah, I've got a fair amount of experience dealing with nuisance aquatic vegetation. Um, so you referenced the mowers, or we call it mechanical harvesting. Mechanical harvesters, okay. Yeah, there's basically three ways to deal with it. There's biological, mechanical, and chemical. Um, honestly, if you limited chemical treatments are, are a good way to go in many cases, if you follow label directions, um, they're probably not really good for widespread use uh, just because we don't want to dump a, you know, a ton of chemicals in our waterways, and they're very, very expensive. Um so probably the cheapest route to go and the easiest route, and, and you could say the greenest route is the grass carp, the biological control. The problem with that is it's difficult to manipulate and the carp don't necessarily stay where you want them. Um, so depending, again, every system's different. And so depending on what the primary use is of the lake or the reservoir um, and w- what the vegetation is that's there and what your goal is, and then you have to make a decision, usually what they call IPM, integrated pest management, is the best way to go. And that's to use a, a portion biological and a portion chemical. Rarely is a mechanical harvester a good idea. I guess up north in some scenarios, maybe. Um, I've only been involved with one mechanical harvesting operation in Virginia, and that was a long time ago on the Potomac River when the Corps of Engineers used to run a mechanical hmm. harvester to create uh, openings for public waterways hmm. through the Matza Hydrilla that were, and this was back probably 15 years ago. 
And, and honestly, it was it was a bit of a boondoggle, and, and the mechanical harvesters just spew fragments everywhere, and they kill a ton of juvenile finfish and, and shellfish if you're in that area. Um, so I just don't like mechanical harvesters. They're, they're expensive, um, and, and they have the issues I just mentioned. So so I think, you know, generally, but of course, grass carp aren't going to stay in a river system. So um, you know, tidal river systems are much more difficult to control nuisance aquatic vegetation in because because they're flowing, obviously. And um, in, a, in a, light, a lake or reservoir, though, it, it's pretty straightforward, I think, with, with either biological yeah. and uh, chemical in conjunction. I was always curious about that because I've been following the, the, the saga that's down in Florida with the, the pesticide spraying and stuff. And I was always curious, well, why don't you just use a mechanical mower? That way you know it's not seeping in because I guess the, the issue is they're over pesticiding. Now it's killing like aquatic grass that the manatees need because it's bleeding out. So it's uh, like, why not just use like the lawnmower just to cut paths and stuff? That makes sense. But what you're saying makes a lot more sense that it would be probably expensive yeah. as hell to. Well, to yeah, none that. of them, none of them are permanent. You know, yeah. all, all of them have a window of time that they're effective. Mm -hmm. the, the, the mechanical is the least. I mean, that, that's the least effective. The stuff's going to grow back within, you know, weeks, months. Um, Herbit chemicals, you know, a lot of times, even when a year, you know, you, you don't, depending on how, how hard you nuke it, you, you might not even have, you know, decent treatment for the whole the whole season. Biological is probably the more permanent if you stock enough. But then the problem is, you then this, that's the hard thing about grass carp is, is not stocking too many. So you end up with no aquatic mm -hmm. vegetation at all. It was just a common scenario because, again, each system's different and the productivity and the type of grass and, and everything. Out migration, um, court mortality after stocking, all these things play a huge role. So it's so difficult to come up with a cookbook recipe to determine how many carp mm -hmm. to stock. And typically, the biggest, well, the two biggest complaints are when people stock grass carp, they don't see any any control, or that everything's gone. So with chemicals, it's not as let's just say I had no idea what I'm talking about. You don't just dump it in there and grass will never grow there ever again. No, it, no, there's no, a no. lot because I feel like no. a lot of people, including myself, that's what you think. You dump the chemicals in an area and you just nuke the whole area completely and grass will never grow. Yeah, and that's it varies too by chemical. There's, there's like seven or eight different active ingredient chemicals that are registered by EPA for aquatic use. And out of those, many are liquids, many are uh, pellets. Um, so yeah. depending on the type of your type of plant you're treating, you, you know, uh, to me, you know, a granular is much better because you control where it goes mm. uh, and, and it, it will kill that plant for at least a season in that location. Um, typically, though, more often than not, you go with a, a liquid formulation that's put out through a device in a boat and, and that will kill, you know, maybe in your treatment area of concern or maybe not because you know it's much more diffuse um and so you typically have to go with a higher concentration which costs more and potentially could have side effects but but again most of the stuff is done at relatively lower levels it's with experienced applicators and they follow the label directions um it's generally safe yeah, that, you find it's mainly navigation huh. or is it like dock owners that don't want to be able to swim off their it's it's more often that, uh, uh from an aesthetic standpoint lake users that just don't understand or care about the mm -hmm. ecological value or of guess, grass okay yeah. or kayaking because that, that's the thing we ran into like holiday is and I, I you know i never did find, i want to know what percentage of people you like is it was it <laughs> I, I i just want to know was it two kayakers and one person wants to jump off their dock because i know there was a lot of vegetation up there too that they didn't even know about that was deeper vegetation like you're talking about before and i get it and i'm and i'm i'm a huge advocate of all users like all lake users regard i'm not it, i'm not just you know selfish as a fisherman there's going to be people pulling tubes and, you know, right. there's a whole difference. So we want to be able to accommodate everybody. So my point to that too was like in a smaller lake, you can't do this on Lake Anna. But if it was just a dock owner, well, let's go in and let's get that out. And let's even try to put some type of barrier, like a big mat or something to anchor it down to keep it. So if all you're wanting to do is jump off your dock and swim, let's, let's, let's take care of it there. But let's leave it in these other areas that, you know, and that's selective is sometimes not always easy on a big body of water but i just asked that question because to me it should be percentage based too almost like how many people are the squeaky wheels getting the oil that's right but if it's happens. only that uh, never happens <laughs> and what ends up happening it's you know it's two percent or something next you know that you got all these hosed up anglers mm. that are like climbing up the i always said like the nra <laughs> with guns you know it's kind of like don't mess with my gun but like you were saying earlier with fishermen we're like man don't mess with my smallmouth like mm. i'm gonna but it's know. also the algae blooms like you said like like how many algae blooms on lake anna may have 
been contributed to the lack, lack of, of vegetation, vegetation. Yeah. like um and that's something's going to eat the one. nutrients that are available yeah. exactly i mean it's going to be algae if it's not grass mm-hmm. it's it's not a secret they're going somewhere that's right with, with and the, uh, the higher the phosphorus i mean they've grafted mm-hmm. their scientists have looked at this for a million years and the, the higher your phosphorus concentrations are the more you skew towards algae from plant life and then the higher it goes from there the more you skew towards blue green algae mm-hmm. the toxic forms of the algae simple math interesting it's just a line We'll make that the next one. Yeah. Jeff, John, guy, thank you so much for coming in. Again, like and subscribe to the channel. Please hit 20. We want to try to hit 20 likes on this video. Again, we are the fastest growing fishing podcast in the greater DMV area. See you guys next time. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.